Welcome to Balthazar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth, a series of conversations about the life and teachings of Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, who is considered to be one of the most important Catholic intellectuals and writers of the 20th century. Incredibly prolific and diverse, he wrote over 100 books. He is also co-founder with Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger of the acclaimed theological journal, Communio. It is the purpose of this series of programs to introduce some of the themes of Balthasar's work, and perhaps to help some understand better why Hans Urs von Balthasar is so important for modern theology and for the lived experience of the Church today. Balthasar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. In this episode, I'm honored to be joined by Dr. Anthony Lillis, Academic Dean of St. Patrick's Seminary, located in Menlo Park, California. Dr. Lillis is the author of numerous books on the spiritual life and is widely considered a scholar of the Carmelite mystical tradition. With Dr. Anthony Lillis, we begin our discussion on Balthazar's book, Christian Meditation. Christian Meditation is at once a book about what meditation is in light of God's revelation, and a book that assists believers to meditate. In a treatment that is both fresh and profound, Balthazar describes the central elements of all Christian meditation, provides a guide for meditation, and then points the way to the union that prayer achieves in the footsteps of Mary, within the church, and in and for the world. We now begin our conversation with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Welcome, Anthony. Chris, it's great to be with you. What a wonderful opportunity to talk about some beautiful truths. I am so grateful, along with so many others, that you are taking time out of your very busy day to help us to really begin the exploration and the conversation concerning the writings of Hans Urs von Balthasar. Uh, Before we talk about his work, Christian Meditation, could you just Give us uh, just maybe a little bit of your thoughts about this man. Well, I've noticed in my own life, in the lives of those who are my close friends, that the work that he did is bearing good fruit in the church. He was a, a Swiss theologian who studied theology to be a priest. He went to some of the best schools in Europe engaged in conversations with the great minds of the time, uh, Romano Guardini, but also Protestants like Barth and so forth. And, and the conversations were never dialogues where he, you know, just kind of said the nice things. When he engaged in conversation, it was always challenging those that he engaged. He was trying to open up the mystery of God who's entered into our world through the Word made flesh. He was convinced of this. At the same time, he saw the word made flesh entering our world. That meant that somehow our culture, our society, our whole way of being was touched by God. And God was at work in it. This created in him a kind of an instinct, a worldview, in which he was always looking to see what God was doing. He wasn't afraid to call sin, sin. But at the same time, He didn't believe that sin was the last word about the world. He believed that the last word about the world was that God's love is doing something new in the world and bringing to salvation all those who will believe in him. And with that conviction, it was almost like he was the right man at the right time because Europe, of course, fell into uh, World War II during and after the war people saw had seen such horrific evil they stopped believing in the goodness of humanity and society and they started to give up and uh, fall into despair or nihilism and he because he lived a deep life of prayer and a deep life of study he was able to speak a word of hope into that he was aided through a friendship with a mystic who was a physician a saintly woman who spent a lot of time in prayer. Her name was Adrienne von Speyer. And she helped him stay rooted in prayer at a time in his life when he most needed somebody to have him 
grounded more deeply in prayer. And and so I, I say all of this, I see in him kind of a model of how to be today. Today, we have so many difficult things going on in the world and in the church. One of the things that can happen is that we lose sight of God's love at work in the world. And we need thinkers like von Balthasar and others to help us open the eyes of our heart and the ears of our heart to hear what God is doing, to see what God is doing and the newness of it and to respond to it with the surrendered authenticity that our Christian faith demands. And Balthazar, for this reason, I think, has impacted the lives of my closest friends, countless students who are now priests in Denver, Los Angeles, and now I'm in San Francisco. I've seen good fruit. I've seen, I've seen priests set on fire with the love of Christ Jesus and profoundly engaged in their parishes. And uh, in, in seeing this and witnessing this, uh, I, I, for me, it's all the more reason that we need to kind of go back to the text of Hans Urs von Balthasar and, and let him teach us how to pray the way he prayed. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I think sometimes it really is important for us to allow the saints to speak. Of course, Hans Urs von Balthasar has not been canonized as a saint in the church yet. God knows the day and time if that were to happen, but it, it, it's important to go back and, and to look at the text and to, to hear what they have to say to us, isn't it, Anthony? I think it is. Uh, sometimes we get impressions of thinkers from other people, and their impressions could be good, it could be bad, and, but then we, we just make the judgment that we think we know who they are and, and what their life's project was because somebody else has represented it in a way that maybe appeals to our imagination. And there's, you know, in a certain way to get through life, we do this all the time. So you know, it's not like it's intrinsically evil to do that, except when you have a great mind, who's all, which is also saintly, or at least has striven for holiness, a great mind that has been open to contemplative prayer and open to our full tradition from the apostolic origins of the church all the way uh, with the saints and mystics all the way to the, the modern time. That person has something to say. And that's why people like John Paul II made Hans Urs von Balthasar a cardinal. And Pope Benedict XVI, upon retirement, they asked him what he was going to do. He said, I'm going to devote myself to reading the corpus of Hans Urs von Balthasar. Um, uh, the reason why a, a saint like John Paul II and a great mind like Cardinal Ratzinger or Pope Benedict XVI would turn to von Balthasar and see in him an, an authority is because he has something to say to us. It's hard work. Getting into his thought is very hard work. I'm not going to, to cut any corners there or say that it's easier than it is. It's tough, but it's tough for all the right reasons. It's tough because he really goes into the scriptures. He bombards you with one scripture passage after another, after another, and he kind of supposes that you know the scriptures and if you don't know the scriptures and you begin to read him it's worth kind of going back and refreshing your memory on the stories he brings up a different one in almost every sentence he knows the lives of the saints and he knows the writings of the saints and again he kind of challenges you to go and read the writings of the saints so that you can understand the point that he's trying to make you i don't always agree with everything he has to say but that's the thing about a great conversation is when you're sitting down with somebody who has an extraordinary mind, they're going to challenge some of your judgments. Sometimes you're right. No, uh, no modern theologian is infallible. In fact, we don't give infallibility even to the doctors of the church. St. Thomas Aquinas says we read even the ecclesiastical authorities like the doctors of the church. We read them, giving them the benefit of the doubt as if they're probably right. But we realize that the only text we have that is inerrant and inspired is the Holy Scriptures. Scriptures and tradition witness to the fullness of truth. And everybody else, all the saints, in their holiness and in their writings, witness to the same truth that is revealed there. And von Balthasar is one more voice in this great chorus. 
But in addition to the fathers of the church and the doctors of the church and the scriptures, the other thing that he does in his writings is he, he has command of Western civilization, of the greatest works of art, of our history, of our cultural achievements. And he brings all of that to bear in his thought too. And so sometimes he re, he's referring to something that you might have in Norse mythology or Greek mythology or uh, some emperor of Rome did at some point. And he just drops the reference and, and you're kind of left there to go, what, what is this? And so you got to kind of go to an encyclopedia or something and, and inform yourself. So that's what I mean by hard work. At the same time, though, those who will engage in this hard work in every single case, uh, you'll discover that you're enriched for having done it. You're enriched for having engaged from Balthazar. And this is why I think some of my students who are now priests, what I've seen in their lives, their lives catch fire because they see that God is at work in the church and through the sacred scriptures, but also through culture and our society. Jesus said that he would be at work until the end of time. And von Balthasar helps us begin to realize how true that is. Well, and I think, again, looking at his life, because you'll find in his writings he has a great love for the church, he's a good son of the church, that in all that he participates in through his writings and his insights, he submits to the church, to the authority, whether it be his superiors with the Society of Jesus when he was a part of the order, but also to bishops to discern and to make sure that he was not leading anyone into error. That is something that uh, his reputation uh, was rock solid, especially during his lifetime, was it not, Anthony? Well, yeah, absolutely rock solid. I mean, John Paul II wouldn't have made him a cardinal if that wasn't the case. And also, you got to look at the times a little bit too. After uh, the Second Vatican Council, there were a lot of theologians who were dissenting from the magisterium. And in particular, the battleground was around Paul VI's encyclical Humanae Vitae, which taught on the sanctity of life and taught about the need to work against and avoid a contraceptive culture, that if this culture ever took hold in the church, it would lead to an increase of, uh, in abortions. And most of the thinkers at the time, most of the ecclesiastical writers and theologians and bishops and all kinds of priests, uh, all the professional class of theologians were upset with and dissented from Paul VI's teaching. Hans Urs von Balthasar and a handful of other great thinkers were the only ones to stand with the Pope when nobody else would. And not only stand with him, but make a great defense of the teaching for human life and for obedience in the life of the church, the importance of obedience in the life of the church. That's where he stands. And the reason why he stands there is because Jesus was obedient to the Father and faith in Jesus demands our obedience and anyone who wants to go to God apart from obedience to the word of the Father as it's communicated to the church, the way they're going is not the Christian way. The only way to the Father's heart through Jesus Christ is the pathway of obedient love that Jesus opened up for us. Von Balthasar was absolutely convinced of that, and because he was convinced of that, it, you find it all throughout his teachings, the importance of being attentive to the word. Anthony, let's discuss his work, Christian Meditation. It is the first in the series of opportunities to dive in depth into his different teachings. And in this, it, it really is kind of a, it's a little book, but it's the entry point for him as far as the engagement with the Word. And for Balthazar, he really does have an appreciation of the importance of what it true Christian meditation is, doesn't he? Yes, he does. He, he always subordinates our activity in prayer to what God is doing in prayer. And just as a matter of principle, that's what characterizes Christian prayer as a whole, is that we believe in the primacy of grace, the primacy of God's action, and our action is to respond to God's initiative. Everything we do is in response to him. 
Uh, and the reason why this is a refreshing voice where is today we have all kinds of things going on. The latest uh, spiritual exercises by person A, B, and C, uh, centering prayer. Each of these instances that I've just listed very briefly, what you'll notice is the emphasis is placed on uh, what we do, our our own psychological achievements or feats of consciousness, or at least efforts at good mental hygiene. And von Balthasar doesn't believe that that is where a Christian should be investing his energy. The Christian movement to prayer is one of much more humble surrender. And that's exactly where he wants to bring us in this book. And he actually says that it is not we who force a knowledge of the absolute for ourselves by means of techniques under our control. We can't make it happen, can we? Uh, that that's right and and so one of the weaknesses of using techniques in prayer putting an over emphasis everybody uses some kind of technique in prayer the question isn't uh, whether or not technique is good or bad the question is how are you using that technique technique is like anything else in life you can use it well or you can use it ill if we use a technique and approach God as if he is some sort of impersonal absolute, we will never offer the surrender of faith that Christianity demands of us uh, because it will always be something under our control. It will never be a real relationship. There are thinkers out there, I understand uh, Ken Wilbur and other New Age thinkers kind of want to talk about Catholicism as kind of a tribalistic, uh, uh, primitive religion where they still putter around in the low level of petitionary prayer and that kind of thing. But Jesus, this is exactly how he taught us to pray. He didn't teach us to reach out for a state of consciousness. He didn't teach us to try to titanically grab hold of an impersonal absolute by our own psychological achievements and and mental industry. Instead, Jesus taught us to love the Father. And the reason why he, he wanted us to love the Father is because the Father loves us. Christianity is about a love relationship. In fact, we believe the love of the Father and the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit precedes the whole world and that the whole world is oriented towards that. Uh, and that this is fundamental reality. This is fundamental grounding. Anything that attempts to go above, beyond, below that, it's not Christian. But not only is it not Christian, it's not really human. Something about humanity is oriented and built towards love, built towards a relationship with the other, built towards a relationship with the other who is beyond me, God. Uh, and every human relationship is an echo of this relationship for which I was made, this relationship with the Lord. And just like in human relationships, anyone who approaches a love relationship, somebody that you really hold dear, you want their friendship, uh, you want them to know how much they're loved, you want them to thrive. Anyone who approaches such a relationship with a technique as if I just employed the right skill set and I'm going to win that person's heart, well, that, that's, that's not a relationship. That's manipulation. And God will not be manipulated. You can't even manipulate the human person without doing an act of violence. But when you try to manipulate God, you end in destroying yourself. When Balthasar is very aware of this, and so he counsels people away from that. He establishes very strongly in the beginning of Christian meditation the personhood, as it were, of Jesus. I mean, he establishes mm. it is uh, the reflection upon him who is God's self-expression. So for us to, to enter into meditation, because we hear that term all the time, I need to meditate. For the Christian, it's all about the encounter with the person of Jesus, isn't it? That's right. And his vision of Jesus is our traditional vision of Jesus. He believes that Jesus knew who he was, that Jesus was fully man and fully God with his humanity and his divinity united in his divine person. 
the Son of the Father. So Jesus is the Son of the Father from all eternity and has gone before us, before Abraham was, I am. This curious thing about beingness now, I am, and human history, he introduces into our history something eternal. He introduces into our humanity something divine. And he does this not despite or uh, trying to get around personhood, as you said, Chris. He does it exactly in the order of persons. He comes to us personally and evokes a personal response from us. And he's able to do this because we came from him through the love of the Father. And we're, we're meant to go to him through the love of the Father. And so what does he do? He reveals to us the love of the Father so that we can arrive at the home for which we were made before the foundation of the world. It's, it's a powerful, powerful thing. And it involves relationality, interpersonal communion, friendship. But the most beautiful friendship one could ever hope for. Friendship so beautiful with joy, so profound, it could make your heart ache. And it should make your heart ache where tears flowing and joy all at once, that kind of experience of, of a beautiful friendship. This is what Jesus is offering. And this is what Hans Christian Balthasar proposes is at the center of our Christian meditation. He, this beautiful one, is coming to us. This one from whom we came and to whom we're head is coming for us, searching us out. And our efforts at meditation are simply to make space to welcome him. He's found in the Word. He is the Word, capital W. And so with Balthazar, as you said earlier in our conversation, he is so steeped in the scriptures, and he would have you be there too, because as he's described him, we not only hear what he has to say to us, but we get to see him, as it were, in action. We get to, as Balthazar points out, he, you know, he weeps over Jerusalem, When he's angry, he understands. When he's clearing out the temple, we begin to feel the the very heart of the passion, the the person who can walk in solidarity with us. I think what you've just shared is begins to open up the mystery. I think oftentimes Christian prayer limps along because we don't realize the glory and splendor, goodness, nobility, beauty wonder of who Jesus is. And from Balthazar always works to keep this in front of our eyes. Jesus, the word of the Father. What is a word? A word communicates meaning to us, reveals to us something. uh, When somebody gives us his word, you can think about a promise, but you possess something of them. You know a judgment that is in their heart. And Jesus, the word of the Father, unveils to us the judgment of the Father's heart towards us. And he will suffer the communication of that judgment in the heart of the Father. He will suffer that all the way to the cross so that we can hear it. He will suffer it into our misery, uh, that lack of love that we all have, a love that ought to be there that is not there, our alienation, our failures, our weaknesses, our void. Jesus will enter into those because he's a word spoken into the deepest depths of humanity so that we might know the judgment of the Father. And what is the judgment of the Father? The judgment of the Father is that he loves us with the same love that he's entrusted to his Son from before the foundation of the world. That love is our life. And so Jesus is this self-expression of the Father. Everything he does in the scriptures Everything he does, he does so that we might know this love of the Father. In Christian Meditation by Hans Urs von Balthasar, he also shows us that he can, Jesus, through the scriptures, initiates and will demonstrate his presence to us. There's a that smaller portion where he talks about his glorious apparition to Paul to whom Jesus repeatedly appears at very difficult moments to console and strengthen him. Because even after his crucifixion and his resurrection, he does not leave the church, 
and he does not leave us. Yes. Still very much engaged. And uh, Balthazar would have us hold on to that, wouldn't he? Yes. The word has fully entered into our humanity and the radical extent that he went into our humanity is revealed by his last wordless cry on the cross when he breathes his last so that there's nothing more to say. And so he speaks to us in human frailty, in our mortality. So mortality, which death, which we fear, sin and death, which evoke separation from God and speak to us about humanity's fate because of our sinfulness. Jesus has entered into that and bestowed into that new meaning. And he did that at the price of what he suffered. So in Bambalthasar's meditation and in his understanding, his vision of Christian prayer, Christ crucified lives in the heart of Christian prayer. Christ crucified who is risen from the dead. And in Jesus' resurrection, the vision that von Balthasar gives us is not the vision of somebody who's kind of escaped death and now doesn't have to deal with human suffering anymore because he's, he's above it all. No, Jesus, who is above it all, has chosen to be at work in the world, unveiling to us his passion and death in a way that evokes from us the same surrender that he made to the Father on the cross so that we can follow in the footsteps of our crucified God. It's not, um, uh, Christianity isn't about escaping this world of woes and, and so that we can finally find bliss after we get out of everything that's wrong with our life, but everything will finally be good. Rather, uh, this pathway that von Balthasar is inviting us to tread, that he sees Jesus calling us to follow, a path to Calvary. And so it involves many hardships and difficulties and sorrows. It involves renunciations and trials where everything goes wrong and the whole world seems to be turned upside down. And when everything is going wrong, von Balthasar is saying, this is exactly when Jesus unveils himself to us and, uh, and makes known the love of the Father in ever new ways. Uh, when we are brought to our extremes, when everything seems to have fallen apart around us, it ex is exactly there because the word has preceded us to that point and waits for us there, waits to unveil for us the love of the Father. When we look at Jesus in von Balthasar's writings, it is the Jesus who rose from the dead and therefore he still has the marks of the crucifixion in his hands. He's still able to show St. Thomas the wound in his side. It's the Jesus who suffered the scourging for our sake so that we might be healed. It's the Jesus who was wounded for us that is risen from the dead. And von Balthasar, he keeps that in mind in his Christian meditation. That's why when we turn to Christ, when we allow our imagination to be flooded with him and we imagine him in the agony of the garden or at the crucifix dying for us or we imagine him in his at the moment of his resurrection it's always the whole jesus the one who was born lived suffered died and rose again who is coming to us and our imaginations can be given over to this jesus because this jesus carries that whole human reality with him now out of love for us to help bring us home. You know, it occurs to me that as you were speaking, Anthony, that in this particular, this very, very, very first section of Christian meditation by Hans Urs von Balthasar, we've gotten, can I call it a, a charisma of Jesus for prayer. Before you even begin the meditation, you have to know the source in which you ready yourself for, that you just can't sit and say, okay, I'm going to meditate now that there has to be this awareness and this desire to see the face of God in Jesus Christ. There's this powerful uh, excerpt. If we want to hear something, we must prepare ourselves to perceive by being still. If we ourselves are talking in it, or our own thoughts, wishes, concerns are speaking within us, 
the noise they make will render us unable to hear. Hence, directions for med meditating always begin by requiring us to create an inner stillness and emptiness as a means of making room for what is being received. And then he says, It would, however, be reasonable to doubt that such efforts in their mere negativity already belong to that positive readiness to listen which distinguishes Christian meditation from other kinds of readiness. And what he's saying here, when we make room and we empty into to stillness to receive this word, as you were saying, Chris, we're expecting the good news. Uh, you're right. This is charismatic. This is a proclamation of the gospel. Already at the beginning of his introduction to meditation, he's inviting us. He wants us to look with expectation and longing. The emptiness we enter into isn't a nihilistic emptiness. It's not a stillness of non-activity. It's a readiness to surrender. It's empty because it's been made so because it hopes to be filled with something so much more wonderful than what filled it before. So we make space in our day. And so we make space during our time of prayer to be still before the Lord who comes to us with salvation. This is what distinguishes Christian meditation from other kind of meditative exercises where they talk about emptiness and stillness and, and concentrating on a prayer word and, and uh, stop racing through all the thoughts and, you know, as, uh, and all that. Well, in Christian prayer, there is a place to present our petitions humbly before the Lord. And, uh, and this is very good. But before we do that, the beginning as we begin to pray, um, there's an act of the presence of God. We make the sign of the cross. And when we make that sign of the cross, the stillness isn't simply reliefs, relief from or release from all the anxieties of the day and the concerns and the, the way that we got ourselves a little bit too energized about this. Yes, we need to let go of that. But the reason why we're letting go of it is because we're certain with the certainty of hope, with the certainty of faith, we're certain that Jesus is coming for us with everything we need right now. And it's that kind of prayer that von Balthasar wants us to discover. It's so powerful in his writings. And I have to admit, there was one section I read that it so echoed Teresa of Avila echoes mm. Ignatius in his colloquy. I mean, it, it's such indicative of the teachings, obviously so steeped in the in the teachings of the saints, that he, he mentions the importance of uh, the silence required of the Christian is not fundamentally and primarily of human making. Rather, believers must realize that they are already possessed within themselves at the same time in God, the quiet, hidden chamber into which they are to enter and in which they end in which they are with the father you know it's like at the center of the interior castle it is the the chair where you're in the room and there is god and you are with him and it, it's very intimate isn't it yes and so this this is one of the reasons then that um uh we when you have this faith in what God has already given you, letting go of um, of, of preoccupations and so forth, it, it's a different thing. I'm not forcing myself to empty myself. I'm realizing that something bigger is in me than my preoccupations and all my anxieties. There's something more wonderful there than the things that have excited my interest right now. I can let those go in light of him and, um, and, and turn my attention to him. He says, we need not first pave our, for ourselves an approach to God on our own. All ready and always, our life is hidden with Christ in God. Accordingly, preparation for meditation does not first necessitate lengthy psychological adjustments but only a brief realization of faith of where our true center and the emphasis permanently are. We seem to be far from God, but he is near us. We do not work our way up to him, 
Instead, our situation is like that described in the parable. From a distance, the father already saw him coming and was moved with pity. Running up to him, he threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. This vision of God who comes for us, the God who uh, is is ready to, to run to us when we come to our senses and turn towards him. This is the beginning of Christian meditation for Hans Ressel Balthasar, and it's so characteristically Christian and different and unique from every other form of meditation of any other religion. It's a supreme gift that those of us who believe in Jesus Christ have been entrusted with, and I hope with this gift that we'll listen to teachers like von Balthasar so that we can make the most out of how much confidence God has put in us. Well, Anthony, it, I so appreciate you helping us just break open just the very small beginnings of chapter one and what really is a, a wonderful entry point into Christian meditation. With Balthazar, you noted, even though it's small, it's rich. And mm. it's important to take time and to reflect and to ponder what he is pointing us to. He's not pointing us to Balthazar. He's pointing us to Christ, isn't he? That's absolutely true. I, I, you know, that's uh, if he were in on our conversation right now, that would be. He, I think he would applaud. This is all about Jesus, and he believed he had a a mission as a theologian to help us find the Lord. In these times, times such as these, we need good teachers like him. So I think he's worth the read. Anthony, will you join us in the future to kind of break up open more of this important teaching, this this entry point into the depths of prayer? I would be extremely honored to. Thank you so much, Anthony. This concludes part one of our conversation with Dr. Anthony Lillis, discussing Hans Urs von Balthasar's Christian Meditation. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with many other episodes of this particular series, visit vonbalthasar.com. There, too, you can also access numerous audio excerpts from this particular book, along with others, in the Balthazar Library. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will consider subscribing to this particular podcast and liking it on whatever platform you may be hearing it on. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about bonbalthazar.com and join us for the next episode of Balthazar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth.